All right. I think we have a number of uh, attendees on now. I believe we are now ready to start. May I welcome you all to the webinar. My name is Edward Kataika from the EXA Health Community. This is our fourth webinar in the series and the last one for the year, organized for the EXA Health Economics Community of Practice through the support of the Tanzlaunce program. These webinars form part of the knowledge exchange and continuous learning for members of our community of practice and all others interested in, in enhancing their understanding and capability of health economics. So our topic for today is on health technology assessment. As you are aware, one of the main objectives of decision makers in healthcare is to enhance population health. Health technologies such as diagnostic tests, medical devices, medicines, vaccines, procedures, programs, or systems of care have the potential to improve health by preventing diagnosis or treating medical conditions, promoting health, providing rehabilitation, or organizing healthcare delivery. However, because healthcare resources are finite, not all health technologies can be adopted and decision makers in all countries face the challenge of improving population health under the constraint of limited resources. This requires assessment of the benefits foregone when finite resources are allocated to one intervention rather than to others. A process therefore becomes necessary to inform decisions about the use, adoption, and implementation of alternative health technologies and other claims upon resources. The better this process, the higher the likelihood of making appropriate decisions when introducing new health technologies. So health technology assessment, or HTA, is a multidisciplinary approach to such a process, which has the aim of informing decision-making and promoting an equitable, efficient, and high-quality health system. Interest in HTA has grown internationally, including Africa, since the WHO resolution to support its use in 2014. So in this webinar, we will hear from three esteemed speakers on this topic. And may I now introduce our three speakers for today. We have uh, Professor Joseph Futsobengo. He is a professor of bioethics and health social sciences at the University of Malawi. He is currently the head of department and the director of the health economics and policy unit in Malawi, as well as the center for bioethics for Eastern and Southern Africa, Sibesa. He chairs the National Advisory Committee on Bioethics and has published numerous articles in Africa and international African and international journals on issues in healthcare and research ethics. He is one of the leading bioethicists in Africa. The second speaker is Michael Drummond. And Michael is a professor of health economics and former director of the Center for Health Economics at the University of York. He is the lead author of the book, Economic Evaluation in Healthcare. Now, into its sixth edition, and arguably the most well-known book in the field of health economics. And I'm told sometimes it's called the Blue Bible in the field of economics evaluation. He has more than 700 scientific papers and has acted, has acted as consultant to the World Health Organization and the European Union. And he has been president of International Society for Pharma Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research, ISPO. He has advised several governments on the assessment of health technologies and chaired one of the guideline review panels for the National Institute for Health and Care, and Care Excellence, NICE, in the UK, and is currently co-editor-in-chief of Value in Health. The third speaker is Justice Novignon, and he is a professor and health economist at the School of Public Health, University of Ghana. He teaches health economics, health systems leadership and evaluation, and health policy, and supervises undergraduate and graduate students of the School of Public Health, University of Ghana, and other universities. Dr. Novignon is currently chair 
of the Global Evaluation and Monitoring Frame Network for Health and is also co-chair of the Health Technology Assessment Agency in Ghana. So those are our three speakers in this webinar. And uh, I will now invite this, the first speaker, Professor Joseph Futsobengo, to give us the first presentation. But as he, before he comes, just to mention here, as we have done in previous webinars, we will ask you to use the Q&A feature. If you have any question, type, that, type your question on the Q&A feature so that it can be considered during the, the Q&A discussion. Or when we start the discussion itself, you may just use the raise hand feature in the panel so that the moderator can recognize you. So with that, let me invite Professor Joseph Futsubengo to give us an overview of the subject. Um, I, uh, is it my, my presentation or just overview? Well, I believe the, yeah, the agenda said an overview, but maybe if you had not prepared to give that overview, then I think I will ask a... a I, 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 can, I can give you the overview, just then. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, just uh, yes yeah, yeah. So the, the overview is that, uh, I just wanted to say that there was a, in Malawi, uh, a government of or Minister of Health, Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. The Minister of Health, uh, together with uh, Health Economics and Policy Unit, uh, uh, when we did the situation analysis and needs assessment, we discovered that there was a need to have something like a FA technology assessment. And therefore, we had a discussion with the, we found strong links with the ministry. Uh, using the platform of Think Tank and Policy Lab, uh, we quickly discovered that there was a gap uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, resource allocation in Malawi in, in terms of uh, having a structure like FA technology assessment. And therefore, through the trans was a partnership, we put a proposal looking at the feasibility and acceptability of that structure. And uh, in that structure, we, uh, we, before we uh, looked at that uh, structure, we wanted to know what was happening in other countries, uh, Ghana, South Africa, uh, UK, um, uh, Thailand, uh, to do that, to, uh, to benchmark, so that we can see what value sets uh, uh, are using or what kind of structures they have. So in my presentation later, I will, I will explain what steps did we take? What steps are we taking in order to achieve that? The main aim of this, as you are uh, the chair of this uh, session has already said, is uh, to promote equity, efficiency, and transparency in acquisition of new um, technologies in a resource um, in a country where resources are not uh, plenty. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for that uh, overview. May I now invite uh, Professor Mike Drummond to give us uh, his talk, HTA and experiences from around the world and a framework for use in Malawi. Mike. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen. Okay. So um, I want to talk about uh, the experience of use of uh, HTA around the world and uh, uh, what we're currently proposing um, for Malawi. And um, first of all, I have uh, some acknowledgements to uh, <coughs> colleagues in Malawi and also um, colleagues in the Centre for Health Economics who are working on this project. So uh, as we've said in the introduction, um, health technology assessment is a multidisciplinary process, um, uses explicit methods to determine the value of a health technology at different points in its life cycle. And I think the important thing on this slide is that 
its purpose is to um, inform decision making. Um, it's not something we just do for research purposes. We really want to um, uh, try to reach uh, improved decisions in the healthcare sector. And uh, as I said, uh, as was just said in the introduction, um, it's a multidisciplinary field. Um, in principle, it can be applied to a wide range of health technologies, including systems of organizing healthcare. If we look around the world, though, it's mostly been applied to uh, pharmaceuticals, medical devices and clinical procedures. But I think um, I think we should view it as a very broad process to try to assist in decision making. And uh, it is growing rapidly worldwide, but mainly at present in high and middle income countries, uh, although uh, there is some activity in uh, uh, lower income countries and, and certainly we will be hearing the experience from Ghana later today. So um, the HTA process uh, really starts with identifying which topics you want to assess, uh, try to specify exactly what the decision problem is, and then at, only at that stage you would search for evidence. Um, if there's clinical evidence, you would do ideally a systematic review of that evidence. And then uh, based on that, we'd do an economic evaluation. And uh, following that, there's also possibly uh, social, legal and ethical implications. And uh, these should also be taken into account when formulating the recommendations that one might make as a result of an HTA. And of course, we need to monitor the impact of that decision. So uh, why would we need this in lower income countries? Well, obviously resource allocation challenges in healthcare are common to all countries, but obviously the, the fewer resources you have, the, the more the need for an approach like HTA to make rational decisions on investments, uh, prioritize needs, and assess the value of health technologies and their implementation. So um, what we want to try and do is implement um, you know, or turn to establish these kinds of processes in all countries uh, and in this case lower income countries. So um, the project we're conducting in Malawi is to provide a framework that classifies the main decisions on health technologies and then try to contextualize this framework to Malawi. Um, we're planning to use uh, two technologies as case studies just to show how HCA could assess policymakers in making decisions. And um, then to explore the opportunities and challenges of introducing these processes in Malawi and other comparable countries. So, so far, this is the uh, kind of framework we've proposed uh, and, it, and it mirrors much of what uh, was in that other framework I just showed you, which is fairly common. Um, so we start with identifying and prioritizing how to identify new technologies, how to prioritize amongst the ones that uh, we spot uh, to, to which ones we would try to evaluate more uh, carefully. And one difference I think in our framework is we put funding fairly high up the list. Um, typically funding comes uh, later on the list when you're thinking about implementation, but we feel that it probably should be addressed fairly early about how, how in principle would you finance this new technology if as a result of the HTA, you wanted to adopt it. So the reason we did that was that, you know, in a country with very limited resources, um, one has to be realistic and um, there's no point in spending a lot of time evaluating technologies that um, it probably wouldn't be possible to fund. And then you get down to the detail stage of uh, evidence, trying to figure out where we would get that from um, how would you synthesize the evidence? And then in adoption, um, obviously you'd want to think about what criteria you would state based on the HTA for the adoption decisions. And, um, you know, do these, are these criteria, can we specify them generically or do they change on a case by case basis? And then again, you get to implementation issues uh, 
including practical ones such as financing, training and so on. And another thing which is often overlooked, of course, is that once you've done your HTA and implemented it, there may be other research initiatives you want to take, um, uh, particularly taking a, a advantage of the experience gained um, in the implementation. Now, what are the challenges in implementing HTA in low-income countries? Well, obviously, one needs some trained personnel to conduct these studies, or probably more importantly sometimes, to interpret HTAs that have been conducted elsewhere. Um, I think all countries, although they may do their own studies, um, they also want to use um, studies that have been done in other countries, um, Obviously, countries differ a lot, but there's always something you can learn, I think, from an existing HTA. And one skill might be to interpret these um, for applicability in the local setting. Um, you may need some local data, although some of that, some of the data necessary may also be already be available locally or internationally for some elements of the data. Uh, but probably more importantly, in these three challenges is the need to link with local decision making processes because if we're trying to um, you know assist decision making we really need to understand what those processes are in in the country concerned. So um, in terms of specifying the decision problem um, the kinds of decisions uh, that HCA could potentially play a role in are obviously introducing a new immunization or screening program, uh, listing a drug uh, or any technology on a national, nationally improved positive list for reimbursement, um, determining whether to fund expensive new hospital equipment, determining the composition of the health benefits package whenever that's being renewed, and determining which patient population should have priority for a given treatment or intervention. Um, other challenges that I mentioned, um, we've been thinking already about um, how we might uh, address these in Malawi. And I think this is going to be one of the, the key features of the project as we go forward. Um, I think we need to think about what are the priorities for application of HTA. And um, uh, we need to clearly specify those because uh, we won't have enough resources to study everything that we would like to study. Um, I think we should also give attention to using the framework of conducting HTA uh, more generally as a way of organising our thoughts about these kinds of decisions. Uh, and I think that can be relatively helpful, even though in some cases might, might, might not have the funding or the time to do a detailed analysis. Uh, also, I think as HTA spreads in low income countries more generally, um, more relevant studies may become available that could be adapted to local use. So Malawi or any other country wouldn't necessarily have to do all the studies themselves. It may be that they can use, um, build on the efforts of people in other uh, similar countries. And there's already some registries of cost effectiveness studies um, that one can consult. Um, they may not be directly applicable to the decision you're trying to make, but um, I think they could be helpful. And then another, th another thing is, uh, I'm thinking of this group in particular, um, are, there, are there some aspects of HGA that could be coordinated regionally? Um, this is something that's happened quite a lot in Europe um, through a network called UNITA uh, that you may have heard of and uh, I just wonder whether it could be applied uh, in other regions including Africa. There's also a network in, in Latin America that uh, uh, coordinates activities in, in HTA. So you know uh, the way I look at it we're never we're never alone in this you know there's always people who could help in various ways and, and some kind of coordination uh, can be useful. So my final point is uh, in thinking about Malawi or any of the other countries in this group, um, HTA is always adapted to the local context. Um, 
it's tended to do better in systems where you have one single payer where you can do a HTA for that payer, like in a national health system. Um, but it does work also in multiple payer systems as well. Um, it can be performed anywhere. Um, it, it can be the ministry. It doesn't necessarily have to be the ministry. It could be um, a separate organisation. I, I think the main thing about the organisation of HTA is that um, you can organise it in any way you want, but it's, I think it's important that the HTAs are credible That that because we've got to convince a lot of people to uh, change their behaviour based on the results of the HTA. So I think you need a credible way of organising the HTA. Uh, as I mentioned before, it needs to be linked to local decision making processes. And that's something we're spending a lot of time thinking about in Malawi. Um, and the starting point, I think, is to consider which of these decision processes um, HTA can inform. Um, I think we need to consider how the decisions based on a can be HCA can be implemented. And as part of that, I think that the involvement of key stakeholders, both within the country and international stakeholders like donor agencies, I, I think that's also important for the success of HTA. So thank you for that opportunity to explain where we've got to so far. And uh, I look forward to the the later presentations and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for that uh, presentation. Uh, we will move on and uh, I will invite again Professor Joseph Zobengo to give his talk, the steps towards application of HTA in Malawi. Joseph, please. Do you need assistance? Are you, seeing it? Are you seeing it? Well, we can, but do, do you need assistance with the screen sharing? I don't know, Steph. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm trying to... Um, um, Can you see it now? Well, we can see it, but it's not uh, it's not uh, the full screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, for the tray. I'm sorry. So the uh, the, my presentation uh, is about steps in establishing value sets and health technology assessment structure in Malawi using uh, value and evidence based decision making and policy to code VEDMAP. As usual, as an uh, introduction, Malawi, like many other countries, have embarked on health system reform in an effort to achieve universal health coverage and to improve upon efficiency and accountability in decision-making on the adoption on the health technology. And many countries, including Malawi, are moving towards establishing health technology assessment. And this was part of the needs assessment we did 
in our discussion with the ministry. Well, we as a well, well established and operational um, in many high income, we have found that uh, many few countries, very few countries in Malawi are actually moving towards uh, that, uh, that, uh, that direction. And this namely Ghana, Ethiopia, and South Africa. And as it was already said, that was actually uh, been supported by WHO in 2015. So as far as smart evaluation of cost and the effectiveness of the uh, uh, medical technology uh, as uh, well as uh, can provide a well and efficient and equitable allocation of resources in, in, in a low income country like Malawi, and it can maximize uh, resource use. So I have technology assessment. Unfortunately, due to scarcity of resources, not all health technology can be adapted. And as I said, uh, the WHO has actually is promoting uh, that uh, uh, that approach. And the, according to the WHO, it defines the HTI as a smart evaluation of properties, effects, and impacts of health technology. And it is a disciplinary process to evaluate social, economic, organization, and ethical issues of health interve intervention and health technology. So, uh, HCA examines a wide range of decisions and uh, barriers, and, that, uh, and also uh, uh, in order to uh, inform uh, future areas of research. But overall purpose of conducting this assessment is to inform policy decision-making and improve quality of life. Health economics and the policy unit in Malawi, in conjunction with Tanzlaos and the, uh, the Center of Health Economics, aim to introduce HTA in Malawi in response to the needs, uh, which was expressed by the Minister of Health uh, uh, to determine how research evidence and values can assist in informing decision relating to the adoption and implementation of health technologies in a country in an objective, efficient, and transparent manner, both at policy and implementation level. So what is the Malawi decision process of coming with an HTA? Well, Malawi has a decision-making system in place. That's what we have found through our research. The system is not guided by values, or uniform standard criteria. In cases where values and standard criteria does exist, like EHP, they are not aligned or practiced. So the lack of value sets, what goes standard uh, uh, value sets for decision making often leads to waste of resources in appropriate investment in health technology, incompatible with existing infrastructure, in corrected use, do not function efficiently, and loss of time. So we just wanted to show you the decision-making organogram uh, in Malawi at the moment. Uh, when we did, uh, first of all, we wanted to do a situation analysis. Where is Malawi now? And where can Malawi go to improve uh, efficiency and transparency in the resource allocation? We have found that they are, or they are, Malawi is using three the community system is not structured so like nice. So it's committee based and not structured for Malawi is like an independent institution. So there's a user uh, of the technology. This is the Minister of Health. Uh, and then uh, we have got uh, the technical working groups which determine uh, the criteria. And there's a task force which makes uh, decisions. And uh, this tool, the user, the task force, and the te uh, technological working uh, group comes with recommendation to the senior management who makes decision uh, to user to the user through the working uh, uh, technical working group and the task force to acquire new technologies. But sometimes the users may just uh, 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 make decision uh, together with senior management. Uh, if things, for example, is based on donation, if the technology is based on uh, donation. 
That's why we decided to come with uh, a tool. Uh, this tool is based on uh, value. It is called value and evidence based decision making policy. It means value and evidence decision making and practice decision making modeling tool for translating organization values into practice. Aligns evidence to value to achieve organization goals in order to optimize the decision making process. So the VEDMAP recognizes that professional and organization value play a play a, a crucial role in motivating for good professional practice. It provides the don'ts and do's uh, for doing implementation. So this uh, uh, VEDMAP has got two pillars, evidence of value and the value of evidence. Evidence of value is an evidence-based approach to map out organization and public values used by individual or organizational public or public for decision making or policy making in order to come with optimal values, what we call a normative value. It is that not all values, not all values are optimal, appropriate to achieve a particular organization or vision or goal or decision. And the value of evidence is on the other hand is that values uh, at value of Of evidence exam the evidence available it involves uh weigh, weighing the evidence according to societal ethical ethical and empirical uh, empirical and professional values so it is just uh, uh, it is there to link the evidence using values uh for example we'll give example of female condom use in malawi and male condoms uh we found that although both of them female and male condom were effective but although female condom was pushed, but we found that uh, it, uh, female condom was not adapted widely because it was not accepted. The acceptability was low, although safety and efficacy was, 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 uh, was, was, uh, was high among the female condom. This is just to show that uh, our evidence has to be guided by values in order to, uh, to be appropriate. So the rationale of VEDMAP, many times and the best available evidence, uh, we have seen that can be ignored due to lack of uh, value, ethical value, like bias, prejudice, and self-interest. So the use of values is crucial in conflict, of, of conflict resolution, uh, conflicts of interest, or ethical dilemmas. So while MOH policy strategy plans and guides, guidelines almost always specify values, we have seen that in, as and guiding principles in their strategic plans. However, we found that uh, there is, uh, they are not actualized in, into practice. For a country like Malawi, lack of values uh, sets used in the practice can be costly in regard to both time and money. To guide a transparent, accountable, efficient, equitable HCA process, value sets would need to be identified, agreed. More importantly, this will need to be applied in ways consistent with goals of HTA. So without assessing whether and how the values are performing uh, in a strategic plan uh, and uh, assessing misalignment uh, of official values and actual values, uh, uh, the implementation uh, can be unknown cannot be known or can be unknown. So HCA success depends on a greater extent on alignment of actual value. Actual values, I will define what the actual values are uh, and uh, to the normative values. So value mapping of the ethics landscape, uh, 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 HTA uh, uh, landscape. Uh, the first part is uh, what we call value map. The, the value map, coming of value map is a process of determining normative and actual actual uh, uh, values, defining as well the measure in order to come with optimal values. And this was done through desktop review, interf interviews and focus uh, group discussion. Mapping out of, uh, of decision-making routes for HTA. So uh, what is the structure, governance structures of HTA? And then mapping out barriers and enablers in HTA landscape uh, using again death review in depth interviews. Eventually, after mapping out values, uh, we did a benchmark, benchmarked not only Malawi, but we did 
to look at values which are being used by NICE, uh, by uh, Ghana, by South Africa, uh, and Thailand. Uh, at the end, uh, uh, the process which is being done now with uh, uh, at your uh, in the project where we're coming with the framework, uh, that one will be uh, will come with a workshop where uh, the postmaker will come and say uh, to see wh whether this uh, framework is acceptable. So the benchmark conceptual framework uh, has developed. The first phase is mapping out of normative values. And normative values are values which are or uh, the written values by the official values. Uh, secondly, we'll be looking at actual values. These are values which are being actually being practiced in the context at a facility level. And then the third level is assessment fidelity to look at discrepancy or misalignment or alignment between what is normative with the positive, what is actually being used at the, at the, at the, at the, at the facility. And eventually uh, looking at the benchmarking other values sets in other countries, coming with optimal values for HTA in Malawi. Not only for optimal value, but optimal structure for HTA in Malawi. So the, uh, the, uh, the first phase, as I've said, is an uh, uh, is application of, uh, we want just to show how uh, VEDMAP can be used, also can be used at the district and central hospital level as a planning uh, tool, uh, especially for fidelity assessment, what's a fidelity assessment, looking at a misalignment. It can also be used at EHP to look at, to come out with uh, uh, criteria for what to include and exclude in the EHP, which values should be included or excluded. And the third layer, it can be used uh, 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 to develop a program to facilitate value alignment in a decision making. And fourthly, uh, it is used to uh, as as a research tool. And uh, lastly, it can be used as a behavior change and mindset change uh, uh, tool. But at the same time, it can be used as a tool for monitoring and evaluation. So, what are the normative values? These are ideal, expected, desirable, permiss permissible, aligned to the goal or vision. These are formalized, would be written or non-written. One example of a normative value would be an H EHP values. They respond to all questions and commonly contained in a policy document strategies and guidelines. Actual values, they are lived and real-time values. These are expected, can be unexpected. These are the values which are uh, people are using, actually using. There could be normative, optimal, suboptimal. There could be formalized and non-formalized. They can be aligned, non-aligned to the goal of your institution, depending on the level of altruism or leadership, ethics and governance, and general, uh, and generally the strength of the systems. So these are values which are, uh, in Malawi, for example, people have said we are good at EHP, but sometimes at this level you find that they are not using EHP, they are using other values. So these are actual values which people are, are actually are using for acquisition of technology. The optimal values are, are formalized. This is based on value of evidence and evidence of value. This is a, this are values which come after you have done research like what we are doing now, are consistent, are consistent with maximization of organization goals. Uh, all optimal values are normative, but not all normative values are optimal. So therefore, similarly, they, we need to, to find out uh, that uh, the optimal values are values we are, which are sensitive to time, space, and context. For example, I just wanted to give an example. In a major uh, situation, uh, value of life is more uh, of a priority than the, uh, than the value of freedom. That's why both can be normative, but uh, uh, life, to save life would be appropriate in an emergency situation than to discuss about freedom. It is the selection of value based on goal and context. That's why this process which has been done coming with the value sets will be done, is not, will be uh, had to be done jointly 
together with policymakers who can decide which ones they want to adopt. The potential value optimization project. So the first level is uh, looking at problem identification and root cause analysis. We wanted to see what, uh, why there are value sets at different level are misaligned. Uh, second, they would like to uh, map out the identification of normative and the policy, which we call actual values. And the third is a fidelity assessment. Fidelity assessment is to look at whether the normative and the positive are aligned or misaligned. And then uh, the consensus through a workshop where we will come to, to look at the optimal value which have been made, which have been presented by the first speaker. Develop, uh, second stage will be developing, implementing a monitoring program on the value of optimization. And the third, midterm evaluation and the final assessment. So, so value mapping and ranking, if you look at that, the first level, we came with normative values and actual values, but the optimal values are still not yet. We are coming with them. Uh, you saw what uh, uh, Prof presented as the structure. But at the moment, we, we wanted to know normative and actual value, not only for Malawi, but from also Ghana and uh, other countries. So in, in other countries, we're only looking at normative. We're looking what is written. But in Malawi, we are looking at what is actually being used. The midterm assessment is to come to have a picture. What is the actual values? Uh, what is the normative? What is being written in the documents, the policies, et cetera? What the people are using uh, to, uh, for acquisition of, of technology? And what can be done? Uh, what values can we come with as uh, our optimal value sets and structure? So value mapping at final level is to be able to say the actual and the optimal uh, and, the, uh, and the optimal should be able to at least start aligning. And the other, uh, at, the, at the final level is what we want is to make sure that uh, the personal values of the decision maker and organization, uh, organization and professional values are aligned. And if you can see on the circle, we know that the personal values uh, goes beyond optimal or professional values. So that's why you see that personal value is bigger. But what we want is that is uh, when the decision making maker is making decision on acquisition of technology, he uh, is incorporating the optimal professional value of his organization. And this can be done through training. As a conclusion, values are crucial in resolving conflict of interest, including uh, inclu within HTA decision-making framework. Absence of value can lead to abuse of a system of vices. So value-based decision-making is mentioned in policy strategic plans, but interventions for value alignment and monitoring evaluation are silent. HTA decision making without aligned values cannot guarantee optimal outcomes. Value alignment requires understanding of all three types of value normative, actual, optimal. Therefore, value mapping and value fidelity assessment are crucial pillars of implementation. Finally, uh, as a project, we'd like to not only look at the value, uh, value map, we have said also we'd like to look at the, the route of decision making, what we call. Uh, decision making organigram, and they would like to uh, propose to Malawi what can to uh, to give options to a uh, uh, policymaker to decide which structures, either as a commit based or independent organization. This is uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Joseph, for that uh, presentation on the application of HTA in Malawi. Just to remind participants that we can uh, use the Q&A feature to, to pose our questions in advance to the presenters if we have any, or if we want to communicate with the hosts, if we have a problem somewhere and we want to communicate, let's use that Q&A feature. We will move on and uh, we will now hear the Ghana experience on HTA. May I now invite uh, Professor Justice Novin to give us the presentation.
Thank you very much, um, Edward. I'm trying to show. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to, to share the experience of Ghana um, on, you know, uh, implementation of, of HTA with this uh, esteemed group, um, wearing one of the hats, <laughs> you know, one of the hats that I wear on this presentation is that I co-chair the technical working group under Ghana's um, HTA. And I do acknowledge um, colleagues from the HTA, TWG and the Secretariat who uh, contributed to this presentation. So here you have the, how it's all officially started, right? This is the official launch or the inauguration of the HTA structures. This happened in November 2019. You'll see the Minister for Health in the middle, the WHO country rep, and other dignitaries. Um, but, you know, before this, we do know that priority setting has been used by different programs, um, you know, in different ways. But the, uh, the, institutionalization or the um, official use as health technology assessment within the country is what is a recent phenomenon. <clears throat> I want to share with you the context, the processes and the current and planned work for the HTA in Ghana. So the context Ghana is, is, is a West African country with a population of approximately 30 million people. Um, the one of the key issues that facilitated, you know, uh, HTA is the transition, right? Ghana in 2010 transitioned from low and middle income country to uh, low and middle income country. And that came with reduction in effective aid, you know, um, from, from many donors. And that meant that the government needed to be take efficiency and priority setting a bit more uh, seriously. Um, but also, you know, other activities and the edge to ensure that we actually uh, move very fast to achieve the SGDs um, uh, um, are key. Um, so as I mentioned, the transition really from development assistance for health is one of the key things. Then also we know that officially the current government, when they, take, when they came into office in 2017, actually declared a Ghana Beyond Aid agenda, which essentially is that let's look for other ways of sustaining ourselves rather than depending on, you know, development partners all the time. Um, but before then, there was, you know, some assessment of the next uh, implementation of the national medicines policy, um, you know, which came up with some recommendations that really provided impetus to the, the consideration and, you know, implementation of HTA. Um, and among the the findings of this, um, this uh, process or exercise was that there was the potential or the grounds were fertile for HTA to be introduced in the country. Um, again, there were issues around systemic and, and technical capacities that needed to be considered alongside um, coverage of vaccines and other essential medicines in the country. So the policy context, <clears throat> Unlike the case of Malawi, you know, where it's being driven from academia that is doing a lot of the uh, underground work and engaging the ministry, Ghana's approach is actually coming from the ministry. So it's actually the ministry, you know, that has taken the edge to, to get HTA working and then, you know, approaching and working with other stakeholders, including the private sector, development partners, and academia. Um, so based on the initial work that had been done, in fact, there was a pilot, um, which I'll talk about in the next slide, but all the, pi the pilots and the initial work on the medicines policy culminated in the 2017 national medicines policy, actually explicitly making provision for HGA to be used for priority setting. Um, so that is good, right? Of course, COVID, COVID has also come and the treatment guidelines and some other, you know, working guidelines within the ministry have provided 
positive ground for HTA to move. So this is the launch of the national medicines policy, um, you know, that explicitly provides for HTA. Um, I will talk about the, the institutionalization process. And for us in Ghana, what institutionalization of HTA means is that we have the structures uh, that will move and ensure that HTA uh, works. We have the steering committee, you know, that is responsible for overall um, implementation of HTA. And then we have the technical working group and the secretariat and others. But also we have sustainable funding mechanisms for HTA. We have the legal framework, um, you know, issues around communication and advocacy, because, you know, you are going to deal with other stakeholders, especially the private sector. So we, we have to, we need to ensure that all these are in place. So for us, this is what institutionalization means. Uh, we haven't gone very far with the process, but at least a few of the things have been done. For instance, the structures for HD have been set up. We have the steering committee, you see the SE here, here, and the steering committee is responsible for, you know, overall, providing the overall strategic direction for HTA, including approving the topic selection and prioritization. Um, and then we have the technical working group, which is responsible for analysis and appraisal, you know, engaging stakeholders and making specific recommendations to the steering committee to take a decision on. The steering committee is actually chaired by the minister or his rep um, and includes other stakeholders such as the civil society, uh, development partners, you know, private sector are all uh, included there. And then on the right here, we have the secretariat, right? The secretariat is actually in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the, um, the, the entire HTA agenda. Um, so including managing, you know, providing management support for the CWG and the steering group. So these are the core expertise that, you know, were, are relevant, you know, as far as we are concerned and that we have um, on the technical working group. Um, we have all this expertise, uh, but we also have the legal expertise on the technical working group because of issues of appeal. And what we are doing is trying to, you know, build a bit more the capacity of the different technical working group members and other groups that are supporting HTA. Um, there is also the HTA strategy um, that outlines, you know, the different strategic interests of Ghana as far as HTA is concerned um, and the different priorities and how to, to, to ensure that those priorities are actually um, implemented. Um, so, before talking about a current plan, as I mentioned, there was a pilot um, implementation. I think that, that slide is off, but a pilot implementation that actually looked at HTA for hypertension, um, which, was, which received support uh, from the International Decision Support Initiative, uh, PATH, AD, and other stakeholders. Essentially, what we did was to assess the cost effectiveness of the different line drugs used to treat hypertension. And that actually provided inputs into the national medicines policy that, that was uh, launched. Now, a number of activities are ongoing. Um, and one of them is actually beefing up the capacity of the technical working group, but also the secretariat to undertake the expanding requests that come. In fact, the HCA, TWG and the structure has received requests, you know, apart from the hypertension work that was done, uh, to also assess, you know, diabetes um, in terms of medicines and some other treatment strategies, to also assess vaccines, um, and then cancers. We've received requests from the National Health Insurance Authority, you know, to help assess the cost effectiveness of uh, screening, adding screening to treatment of cervical cancers as part of the National Health Insurance Scheme. And of course, we're also working around childhood cancers, you know, which are not on the scheme, but have some drugs, especially lymphoma, which are already approved on the scheme. So uh, we are working around assessing the cost effectiveness of using those existing drugs um, to treat childhood cancers. Um, but there are also other activities around strengthening evidence for the national medicine selection uh, process, you know, making a case for 
um, AMR, um, antimicrobial resistance, and, and uh, management strategies. And then also the capacity strengthening. We now have two postdocs that have been hired courtesy um, one of our partners, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, who are you know, helping us to undertake the HTA from the increasing demand that is, that is coming in. So in conclusion, I want to say that Ghana's approach to HTA um, has not been all smooth. Um, it's been a learning process for us. And we're also working with other partners, you know, uh, HITAP and, 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 and the other countries that have taken the lead to see how, um, you know, we can improve upon this. But as far as the policy front is concerned, you know, we've made the, 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 the greatest gains in policy, i.e. that HCA, as far as the ministry is concerned, has been approved. Uh, the next step is ensuring that the other aspects such as vaccines and other um, medicines and other tech health technologies, you know, come on board and we are able to implement um, the, the, the strategies as we have them. So I would like to thank all of you for listening and I look forward to discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Justice, for that experience uh, from Ghana. So participants, there we are with the three presentations from our esteemed speakers. They have shared their experience on the application of HTA in uh, various settings. We will now uh, go to the Q and A. I do not see any question that has already that has been posed in advance to to, to the panelists. So I think uh, we will rely on the raise hand feature. And uh, as we go to the Q and A, I will ask uh, Paul to moderate the Q&A, and then I'll come back after the, the Q&A. If there are any questions, please uh, just uh, raise your, use the raise hand feature in, the, in our panel. Okay, th th thank you, uh, Edward, and thank you to the three speakers for, again, three really excellent talks. Uh, as Edward indicates, we can have um, questions using either the, the raised hand feature, which you can see uh, at the bottom uh, of the participant list, or, or the Q&A box. Um, so um, you, you, you see even those two, um, you know, please, if you have questions for the speakers, uh, now, now is the opportunity. Um, it's great to see we have a really large attendance today. I think it's 37 uh, uh, people that uh, have joined from, must be many countries. Um, so no, e, no, e, even uh, if there's not um, direct questions in response to the presentations, um, if the if the people on the call who are who are working on HCA in other settings, um, you know, particularly within the EXA region or also potentially in West Africa, please uh, feel free to raise your hands and. Uh, inform and tell the group uh, about your experiences uh, with uh, with these. Um, so I can see one question in the Q and A from Pete uh, Peter Baker. Uh, I wonder, Pete, whether you'd be willing to um, ask the question yourself. If not, I can uh, I can read it read it out. Hopefully, a microphone's working. Hi, hi, Paul. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Pete. Wonderful. I think I needed your permission to uh, be unmuted, but uh, oh, <laughs> thank I you. Wonder, I wonder, um, Steph, is it possible to unmute everyone uh, just in, uh, in case of future questions? Sorry, Pete, after you. Uh, just and uh, thanks, Paul and Steph, and thank you to the speakers for some excellent presentations um, and to hear about the progress. Um, I just, I'm really intrigued about, um, uh, I, I haven't met Professor Joseph before, but your presentation on on trying to understand the values in Malawi and how that might uh, be measured firstly, and then how it might be, um, I guess my question is really, how do you actually bring that into decision-making? What approach might, might Malawi want to use? Um, and I think I'm asking this probably because it's an area that we've struggled with a lot, um, both in the UK and in, in NICE, um, but also 
uh, in the countries that we work with around around the Africa and other and other places, um, how best to bring in ideas of equity and values. It's a really challenging one, and I'd I'd love to hear your your experience and your ideas how it could work in Malawi. Thanks. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, 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 what we're doing now is uh, not it's something which we want to. Um, uh, as part of the research, is, uh, we have seen that uh, we wanted to map out the values uh, which uh, people are using. So what we call normative values. Uh, and then second, I wanted to see what values which people are actually using uh, in, uh, in acquisition of adoption of, of technology and what we call positive or actual values. And then I uh, wanted to look at uh, whether there was alignment, uh, meaning that uh, the values which are being used at facility level are the same values which have been uh, written in the document uh, or in the in the uh, in the uh, which are normative. And that, we call, that process we call it value policy uh, or what confidential assessment, whether whether we want to establish alignment or misalignment. And in the process of establishing misalignment or alignment, we wanted to see uh, wanted to see what are the barriers and neighbors barriers. Why are these uh, normative values which have been written uh, for decision making uh, for uh, are not used or used? So what we are doing in Malawi, I think for Malawi, I think uh, the value sets uh, will be very important in the. If you look at what Mike has presented. On the framework, there's a one a place where they're calling we call adoption. So adoption is where a uh, set of values uh, will be uh, have to be uh, determined. But uh, uh, the vet map is a tool which helps uh, the post maker come with the values. Uh, because sometimes people are coming with values, sets, but uh, it's not done in a, in a, in a, in a, in a formalized or in an objective manner. So this way, the process which we are doing now, looking at normative values, and when we are looking at normative values for us, we looked at NICE, we looked at, we benchmarked what is being doing, done in Malawi, what is being done in Ghana, in South Africa, and then we are saying what is happening on, in Malawi, on the ground, what, uh, what are the policies saying, which values, and then we go to the, to the, at the decision-making point, which ones are being used. And then uh, with the discussion with the postmaker, who will then come to say which ones, uh, which ones are optimal. Uh, if this one is not working, why is it not working? Can we come with another one? So that, that's what we are doing. It's not yet uh, the VEDMAP as a method is not yet being used. We are just using as a part of research, but we would like to, uh, um, the minister is also interested to make sure that uh, they adopt the process itself of coming with value sets. So, I don't know what I've answered yeah. you, Peter. Thank you, Professor. That's fascinating. Thank you, Joseph. And there's a related question here from, from Fred, Fred Matovu. Um, Fred, would you be willing to read out your question? Okay, uh, thank you, Paul. I was just trying to figure out a situation where you want to develop an optimal value and where from a two opposing kind of, uh, you have normative values, which are kind of written in the documents like uh, uh, just was saying, and then the actual value that I practice, but there could be some kind of conflict between these two values. How would you reconcile that kind of situation to come up with a, an optimal value? What kind of process? But I now think what uh, he was explaining is that you want to engage the policymakers and see what works and what is not working and why. But I just want to learn more about the process of coming up to an optimal value when there are some conflicts between normative values and the actual value which are actually practiced. Yes, uh, the first thing what you, you do is that uh, you look um, you look whether the conflict, the values which are being uh, uh, because which are being used are the, the actual values are normative. It means that whether they are also expected. Because it can happen, something is normative, is written, but they have, they have missed certain variables, values which are uh, may be appropriate. So uh, at the, uh, the most simple question is whether at actual those actual values are normative. 
Uh, secondly, is uh, whether we, 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 know, we want to know whether it's sensitive to the context. As I gave example, for example, in an emergency situation, uh, you have got two values. One is freedom, one is uh, to save life. Uh, both are normative. I expect the values. But in an emergency situation, appropriate value will be, will be saving life. So I think uh, we need to, when we come in with optimal values, we may, you may just select the values based on what uh, it was written somewhere in the UK or in Mongolia, but you, you didn't understand your context. What are the problems? What are barriers? That's why when we are talking about uh, the process, what we are, the third level of our research is when, first of all, we will benchmark uh, the value sets, and then Mike Dormont has come with the framework. Then we will come back to the post maker to say, we have seen you have got these post uh, values which we have said EHP values, but they are not being used at the, at the at decision making. Why? We found that these are the reasons. So we are proposing this value. How do you feel? So they will either knock in or knock out the value sets. So we come with a list of value sets which can be used as a criteria based on the context. For example, I've said in a country where there's uh, there's enough money, they will not equity will not be a, a value set, uh, something which is a, uh, a important value. Perhaps they will look at efficiency, but not equity. In Malawi, where resources are, we are resource constrained country, uh, we will make sure that equity is there. So that's why uh, context and that whether something is contextual, context sensitive time specific and normative that is expected and is aligned to the goals what you want to uh that's what i think the question to help us to refine the the, the framework uh is not yet fully but the, all questions and comments are there to help us to uh to perfect the tool yeah thank you joseph so um so I just wanted to say, I say oh, and the, uh, the process also had to make sure that you have got two pillars. Uh, the, the framework has got two pillars, what we call uh, value of evidence and the evidence of value. Value of evidence, it means that uh, value of evidence, uh, uh, evidence of value is that you need to come with values. You need to map out in empirical matter to see what actually is happening. And then you rank value. Not all values have got the same, uh, the same weight. So you rank, you help the, the post maker to rank to say, these are the values which you want, you have been making decision. Can you rank and come with at least eight uh, optimal values which you want to be using to make decision for adoption? Uh, and the, this process should be also be informed by evidence, uh, evidence-based approach. That, thank you, Joseph. Really uh, interesting uh, uh, questions. Uh, there's lots of uh, food for thought uh, here in the Legend Value and, and evidence. Uh, could I see if there are any uh, further questions, particularly um, if there are any extra uh, community members? I see a hand up from uh, from Richmond. Um, Richmond, could I ask you also, so I've asked the people, um, uh, to do, introduce yourself and, and ask your question? Okay, so my question is for both um, Professor Justice and Professor. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, my experience indicates that in Asia, the regional support and collaboration by Asia Link for HTA development in individual countries in Asia is actually facilitating their institutionalization in the independent countries. I just want to find out um, for Ghana, um, in terms of institutionalization of HTA, what is the expectation in the next five years to 10 years? Is it something that they think um, would have come to stay and develop to a stage that uh, they can help other African countries? 
And this is the same question for uh, Malawi. In terms of their current state, do they envisage having uh, HTA institutionalized such a way that maybe between five to eight years or 10 years, there will be a, a regional collaboration which can help other African countries to institutionalize HTA. Thank you. Thank you. So, Chris, would you like to respond? So, can I start? Um, um, maybe if we, if maybe if Justice could respond first. Okay. Then... Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, th thanks for that. I think that the the issue of the regional link. Uh, is, is very useful. Two years ago, um, IDSI, actually supported by others, organized an HCA South Saharan Africa event in Ghana. And this brought people from different countries. I don't know if Malawi was here, but Kenya, South Africa, and other countries, you know, and the, the idea about a regional link, um, you know, came up. But I think that this opportunity that we're having now also helps us know what other countries are doing. And, um, I think we probably need to need to get going in terms of that. Can I use this opportunity to quickly also um, talk about how HTA, you know, uh, is used in the ministry? I, I saw I see a question there in the chat box about the NHI. So as I said, the the initial pilot actually fed into prioritizing the medicines that were most cost effective in the national medicines policy, which means that those are what the NHIs will reimburse providers for. Uh, we also received, uh, you know, requests from the NHIS to assess, you know, inclusion of cervical cancer screening. And then we are working on childhood um, cancers also. So once these go through the process, the steering committee, the TWG analyzes and appraises and sends recommendation to the steering group, which is chaired by the Minister of the Red. It is approved at that level where the NHI CEO also sits. Um, that more or less becomes a framework that you know, NHIS can actually work with as long as, you know, we go through the process of, if it's a medicine, it has to go through the national medicines policy selection process and all that. So that's how uh, it's worked for now. And the most direct way of influencing policies is through the NHIS. But like I mentioned, there are other ways, you know, through vaccines that are not specifically handled by the um, health insurance authority. Thank you. Thank you. Just so we we are at the end of our time, but I, I still get the sense there's a, a number of questions and um, time for discussion. Um, so if people are happy to stay on, uh, I suggest if we can continue for uh, 15 minutes uh, or so. People need to drop off uh, the call. That's uh, of course understandable. Um, we I also want to leave a uh, um, five ten minutes at the end um, to talk through the Global Health Economics website and how you can gain access to the, to the series of webinars uh, that we've had uh, in recent weeks and will continue uh, in the new year. Uh, but maybe if we have time for um, one or two more questions and then uh, we can move on to a presentation about the website. So please, please stay with us if you, if you are able to. Um, so I see a question here from, uh, hopefully pronounced Ms. Wright, Gedeka Dominic. Um, also for Prof Nominion, would you, um, you would you be willing to, to to read out your question, please? Hi, Paul. Ah, Dominic here. I haven't I haven't raised the hand, so. Ah, okay, thanks, Dominic. Um, it, 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 so I'll, I'll hand to you, Dominic. Do, Dominic and Koma. From Hepu in Malawi. Oh, oh no, I was saying that I didn't raise a hand. Oh, sorry, no, there's another dominant. <laughs> so okay. Is there a, a, a question from Gedeka? So um, I'll read out the question um, for you, um, Justice. It's, um, it's great to see progress regarding HTA um, in Ghana. Uh, please, can you say more about what frameworks have been used or are being used in, in Ghana? I'd also like to know whether there's a window of, of opportunities for others to support capacity building. Um, so, yeah, in particular frameworks and forms of analysis, could you maybe say something more about this? Is it cost effectiveness analysis or do you also draw on other forms of, uh, of analysis in, in Ghana? 
Yes, so thanks very much. Um, you know, we have used cost effectiveness analysis, you know, in the pilot and some of the current ones, but, you know, there are also evidence, um, other rapid reviews, you know, that have been used, particularly relating to the medicine selection. And we are now building a lot of capacity around the different, you know, uh, frameworks because the, the technical working group sits as a broad group with different expertise. Um, and so we are using the opportunity. I, I think a lot of what we are doing now uh, is, you know, the cost effectiveness analysis, but we are also gradually introducing MCDA, um, multi criteria decision um, um, analysis, um, and, and, and also learning more from, from other countries. So in terms of capacity uh, building, we are working with different partners, and I think that the Ghana HCA structure is open. Um, we, have a, we have a capacity strategy, uh, media, short term, medium term, and long term. Um, you know, long term to include PAGs and some other you know, capacity. And <clears throat> we are open to discussing with other stakeholders um, who may be interested um, you know, in helping support the ministry's efforts. The, the good thing is that the Tenga Working Group, you know, has different universities in Ghana supporting it. So it's not like it's just University of Ghana um, that is doing that, but, you know, KNUST and other universities that also run some programs, short courses and others around HTA, economic evaluation, um, you know, reviews and others. Uh, so we, we, we are mindful of that and are working around a broad strategy to build capacity not only for the technical working group, but also generally for others in Ghana who will be able to support um, going forward with, with HTA. Uh, thank you, Justice. And there's one, um, I think, final question uh, here from Melvin uh, Obata. Is please, can you say something about how the public um, has been involved as a stakeholder in HTA in Ghana? Yes, so a lot of the engagements we've done so far has been with, you know, different stakeholders, but also the civil society and patient groups. Um, one of the big things going forward is how to engage, you know, different patient groups. Um, um, and I guess that's, <laughs> that's a better way of engaging the, the public, uh, but also, you know, through the media and some other uh, strategies that we are thinking of, ensure that the public are aware, and you know any decisions that come, um, you know, are communicated properly, not only to the pharmaceutical companies and other private sector players in there, uh, but also to the, the the people who are the community who are really the, the beneficiaries of any decision that we have to take. Um, so there are different different strategies that we are coming up with. I also mentioned the legal parts, especially uh, dealing with the pharmaceutical groups and other private sector companies. And we have a legal person on the, on the TWG that is helping to uh, derive a strategy that will help us engage um, people as much. So yeah, we, we, it's, it's still a young process. Um, and I guess a year or two or three, uh, we, we should be doing well. Thank you, Justice. And I just wonder, there's uh, there's one uh, final question in the um, in the Q and A bar from from Tom Hart, and I wonder if I could direct uh, this to Mike, to Professor Mike Drummond. Um, Mike, you in your talk, you said something about the importance of the credibility of of HTA studies, uh, and I think in countries across the world, HTA is still a kind of a nascent field. Uh, and the demands for HTA, HTA seem very, very high. Uh, and the extent of analyses of particular questions can involve full research teams. You also give the suggestion that evidence from DCP or the Tufts uh, repository uh, could, be, could be used as kind of off the shelf evidence. I wonder if you can provide some guidance to, uh, to the community as to how the choice between Quick and easy approaches to HTA versus much more detailed but challenging as, uh, approaches can be can be pursued uh, as HTA grows and develops uh, within um, you know, in, in, in countries as represented across all, all of this community. Yeah, um, I think the credibility issue. I, I raised that mainly in the context of 
the status of the organization and whether it could be perceived as being free from biases of, of different types. Um, but obviously there is also credibility in the, the quality of the analyses that might be done. Um, I think I was speaking more to the problem that a country like Malawi wouldn't have a lot of resources to do many of its own studies. And so, you know, it may be worthwhile looking at what's being done elsewhere in order to adapt it in some way for the local context. And um, there, are, there are one or two algorithms or checklists around, you know, including one from UNETA that talk about how you might transfer uh, bits of evidence or results from other previous studies to your own context. And, and it may well be the case that um, you'd never be able to take the exact estimates and apply them in your own country. I think the use of a study from elsewhere can also be understanding how they frame the issues and the, the alternatives that they looked at in that study. And obviously it wouldn't be relevant to you if, if the alternatives in that study were, were completely different from the ones that you were facing in, in your local setting. So I think my, my view would be you always need to look what's being done elsewhere. Uh, and it may be that some of those things you reject as being totally irrelevant to your situation. But I think you always learn something from um, seeing a study done elsewhere, even if you can't just take the estimate and apply it in your own country. Yeah, th thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, this brings us to the end of uh, our time for the webinar. I'm going to pass to Steph Richards in a moment, who will talk through the website. Um, and this is the, the final uh, of the initial, uh, the final in the series of the initial four uh, webinars. The first one we had was on intersect all resource allocation, secondly on digital health, then on refugee health, and now uh, this really interesting webinar on health technology assessment. Um, the group would like to continue uh, with these uh, next year and we'll communicate uh, with you all to try to prioritise topics uh, and speakers for future webinars. Uh, so please keep your eyes uh, open on your in inboxes for that. But I wouldn't if, are you ready if I can hand over to you for a final few minutes? Sure, yeah, thank you, Paul. So let me just share my screen. So, great, so hopefully you can all see that. Um, so, yep, so my name is Stephanie, I'm the, um, the project coordinator for the Tansy programme. Um, and this is just a, a quick presentation as a run through um, of the Global Health Economics Hub to give you a bit of an overview of, of how you can kind of continue discussions um, on following these webinars. So um, this is a bit of background to the Global Health Economics Hub. Um, as, as you may already be aware and has been discussed um, previously in this webinar series, this is um, an open access community of practice um, to support um, health economics research capability and its use within policy um, in low middle income countries. Um, so the hub represents a collaboration um, between the Tanzi Lonzo program um, and the um, East Central and Southern Africa Health Community. It's been developed for um, anybody really interested in the field of health economics. Um, so that the hub op offers a platform for knowledge sharing as well as collaboration and engagement um, and training through um, dedicated discussion forums um, and access to resources on career development as well. Um, it's been primarily developed to support the, um, the recently established um, EXA uh, Health Economics Community of Practice, but as um, an open access platform, it's also available to facilitate uh, online engagement between professionals um, in this region and the wider global health economics community as well. So um, this is just a, um, a few uh, resources that will help um, with these next steps. So if you were to follow this link, and um, this will take you through to the Global Health Economics Hub. This is the homepage of the hub. And um, I'll just do a very quick run through um, a little tour of the website. So. You can see on here, there's an overview of all the areas that we currently have on, on the hub. Um, it's a bit of a background about why it was set up, as I mentioned. And we also have um, other pages on here and links to our um, Twitter account as well. 
But if we just walk through a few of these, and um, one of the main areas on the website is the training resources section, which you can see here. Um, so this has um, several different topic areas, which we currently um, are, are using to uh, populate with the materials that we're uploading at the moment. The, um, the materials include educational um, and teaching materials mainly. So there's course uh, lectures um, and presentations on health economics topics. And we also have a short courses page here, which has a range of different courses which people can access and they have lots of different materials on there and recordings as well, which you can view online. Lots of information on there too, to have a look through. Uh, we also have a webinars page as well. Um, our first webinar was, um, was held um, back in May when we launched the site and we will be holding more uh, webinars through the hub in the coming months as well. So this page will keep um, a record of those and have the, the materials uploaded on there too. Uh, we also have a publications page on here as well, which is um, a dedicated page for any written resources which might be of interest to the hub members, um, including articles and publications, and also tools on the subject of health economics as well. Uh, so these are all available for study purposes too, and there's links on here to um, the, the aforementioned um, Global Health Economics book, um, as well as practical guides and, and tools um, and articles. So we'll be continuing to populate this page as well. And then uh, one of the other key pages that we have on here is the community page. And, and one of these is, is the groups page, which I'll come back to in just a moment, um, which is uh, has several different areas on there, but these are set up as discussion forums um, for interaction with, uh, with other members on the hub about key topics. So that brings me back on to this, uh, the next steps for this webinar series. Um, if you would like to continue discussions on the topics that have been raised in this webinar series, you can do so um, via the hub, um, by, uh, by, by signing up to the hub, which is a free process. Um, and you can do that by following this link down here. And that will take you through to the, uh, the Global Health Trials page. And there's a very short form to complete um, with your details on there. And what that will give you is a username and a password. And you can then use that to access the hub as a member. And that will give you access to all of these forum pages. Um, so what we've done um, on the hub for this particular webinar series is we set up um, a standalone um, forum um, for the, the EXA community of practice and the, the webinar participants, um, which you can access here. And I'll just show you what that looks like um, from the inside. So if we go onto the groups page, this is all of our, um, our forums at the moment. It will be this one here. Um, to access this page, you'll just need to um, complete the form which you saw um, just back here. Once you've got your username and password, you can then um, you can then log on to the to the hub, and you can then access uh, this page um, here, which you can see I'm already logged in, so I can see this. Um, and what we will do is we'll set up topic areas for each of the webinars um, on this page, and that will give you an overview of the abstracts for all the webinars held, um, a summary of of everybody who's um, presented and all the presentation topics which have been covered. And then you'll also um, have an access to a recording of the webinar as well, so you can watch that back in your own time. And then we would um, we'd welcome everybody to use this page as an opportunity to, uh, to discuss the topic areas, uh, to raise any questions um, which you would like to, um, to, to raise with the, uh, the presenters and to, um, to generally hold discussions on, on those topics. If you would like any help with setting uh, an account for the, uh, the Global Health um, Economics Hub, then we're more than happy to do that. And um, we just ask if you could just uh, let us know, um, you know, the email address you'd like us to use and we can complete this form on your behalf if you would like, and then we can send that, that information through to you. Um, we'll send you an invite by email so that you can access those hub forums um, as well. Um, and then just as a final note, um, before I hand back over to Paul, um, we'll be circulating further details about all of this um, after the, the webinar as well. So we'll include all of these links um, in an email 
and we'll be sharing further updates in due course regarding um, further webinars which are coming up, which will be hosted through Zoom and made available through the Hub and keep you updated about those. Um, and just a final note as well, um, on this page we have a feedback survey, so if you would like to leave any comments about the Hub, you know if you do have a chance to have a look at it or, or leave any suggestions, then we would obviously welcome your input into the, the Hub as well. Um, so I think that covers everything, but if there's anything I've missed, um, please do let me know. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Steph. I, I, I guess uh, that's, that's about it, yeah. So this uh, brings us to the end of the webinar, and I would like to thank you all participants for, for participating. I know a couple of a number of you have participated in the three other webinars that we organized uh, earlier. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we do hope that uh, you will continue participating in the other webinars that we will organize in the future. Let me also thank our three presenters for today, uh, Professor Drummond, Professor Futsu Bengo, and Professor Justice Nonvignon for those uh, stimulating uh, presentations. Now, like we said, this is the last webinar for the year. We've had a, a total of four in the last couple of weeks. And as Paul said, we will be organizing more in the, in the coming year. But at this juncture, having organized these four webinars, we would like to solicit your views on how these are organized and uh, how we can uh, improve the organization of future webinars. So there's a feedback form that will be circulating to everyone who has participated in the last uh, four webinars, and we request you to give us your feedback. So Soraya will be reaching out to you with the feedback form, and please uh, give us the feedback so that we, we improve the way we organize uh, our webinars going forward. So with that, I would like to end the webinar this, and thank you all for your participation. I hope to interact with you again in the coming year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.